Well, why don't we uh, begin this next very exciting panel, certainly for me, um, as part of our agenda. Questions that I came away from this morning, are, are we already in a new era of history in light of the changes that we heard uh, General Dempsey and the previous panel discuss? Should the United States adjust its strategy and its approach for, for a world that is very different even than five years ago or 10 years ago? And certainly if we, if we try to project forward five years from now, it will be even more different. So is there a new framework that we need to, to employ to, to make sense of what's going on and to um, help navigate a lot of the changes so that we can remain as secure and prosperous uh, as we have been. So I am very excited to be in this discussion. At certain points, you might just see me watching and listening because I'm just very interested in what our, our, our two leading strategic thinkers have to say, uh, uh, two people who were at the top of the United States government in terms of strategy uh, and policy. We heard, we heard General Dempsey say this morning, uh, uh, continuous, uh, very often, how important it is for the Defense Department in particular to innovate and to adapt. He had a, there, there was an offsite to go through, how do they better do that regarding decision making, regarding day-to-day uh, -day military activities around the world, and regarding how we uh, use our forces in crises. Um, and I think in the last panel we heard how global trends are already disrupting. Uh, the order that many of us are very comfortable with and think we have a mental framework. But I, uh, I came away from those discussions with my framework sort of on the floor and we have to figure out a way, how do we pick it up uh, and, and go forward? Um, I wanted to reiterate a couple of the points that, that um, Atlanta Council President and CEO Fred Kemp made um, this morning. Um, I do think we're in a new era where we have not just nation states to deal with, but uh, as, as Moises Naim himself has written about and talked about so much, uh, where individual actors can have such significant effect where in some cases they're leading the way on solving problems, but also on generating, uh, generating some new challenges. And the question that we've been working on here at the Atlantic Council a little bit is uh, since World War II, <coughs> The, the most important goal in most US strategy documents was stability. But are we in a time now where that is one goal but not the only goal? Should we be looking more at these changes uh, that are going on? And so the moniker we've given for this, this analytic framework is dynamic security. Should we be looking at some of these changes and, and maintaining stability where we can in certain domains, in certain areas, but looking more at how do we harness these changes? to strengthen our advantages and strengthen those of our, of our allies and partners. And so we're, we're calling this a Westphalian plus world uh, for, the reason, for reasons that might um, seem obvious. So let's get right to it uh, with that brief introduction. Um, I will just briefly introduce my panelists here who do not need a long introduction. Um, to my immediate right is uh, Stephen Hadley who is uh, a founding principal at Rice Hadley Gates LLC and the chairman of the board of directors of the US, U.S. Institute of Peace. He served as the national security advisor to President George W. Bush from 2005 to 2009. Jim Miller is president of Adaptive Strategies LLC. Um, he was just recently undersecretary of defense for policy in the Department of Defense. Both of them are speakers. Both of our speakers are on our board of directors here at the Atlanta Council, uh, with Steve, uh, a longstanding member, and Jim just recently becoming uh, a member. And I'll talk to him about the hazing uh, process that goes on for new members after the panel. Um, so I think, I think with that, uh, um, let, let me just ask the first question of our panelists: What, what can we? What is the, what is this new world? Is it different than the world we've all grown up and been comfortable with? What kinds of things do you think are most important for us to be looking at and making sense of? Mr. Hadley? Uh, I think uh, it is a new world. I want to, um, by the way, um, salute the Atlantic Council for taking on this subject. I think it's extremely hard. It's, you're sort of grappling with this, this woolly bear of what the future is. And I, 
salute all of you for coming because I think uh, the result of this kind of conflicts is not going to this kind of conference is not going to be the kind of cookbook, uh, very concrete outcomes that you, we can get if you want to have a session on Ukraine. But I think it's a, an important thing to be thinking about. Uh, one of the things, of course, and I'll just say some things we already know just to set the table. Um, an accelerating rate of change um, that we will need to get used to. You know, stability used to be you put, found the tiger and you locked him in a cage. We're going to have to find the stability by riding the tar tiger. And you know why people ride the tiger. It's because if you get off, you get eaten. So we are going to have to ride this tiger of change. And it's going to be a, a very different world. And the, um, the uh, work that the Atlantic Council has done to paint the picture of the world in 2030, I think, is a very good uh, starting point. Um, it's going to be a different uh, population we're dealing with. Uh, it's going to be younger. It's going to be more urban. It's going to be more middle class. It in, and it is empowered. It's empowered by their own sense of selves. It's empowered by technology. It's, they are connected. And they are enabled by that technology. And they are going to make increasing demands on their governments. Um, we have seen new actors uh, enter the field. Um, Subnational groups, non-state actors, terrorist groups, organized crime, those are the bad guys. Uh, we've also seen a growth of uh, non-governmental organizations, civic organizations, foundations, universities, corporations. These are now decisive actors in the international space. It's not just a matter of governments anymore. And of course, the technologies we've already talked about, which are revolutionizing the world. I think the other thing we have to say is that the environment is more challenging for governments. There are more actors on the, on the field. And we have, I think, a face a crisis in governmental capacity. If you look around the world, um, countries, uh, particularly in the Middle East uh, and South Asia, that are facing both transnational challenges about terror, proliferation, organized crime, narcotics, trafficking, you name it and also uh, the resurgence of divisions within their own countries based on tribal, ethnic, uh, and, uh, and religious. And their capacity to deal with these things, not just as a matter of budgets, but it, uh, just as a matter of governmental capacity, is, is, is very limited. And I'll, the last point I would make, I think the, one of the things that, one of the risks we make is we think this is all about harnessing technology and training security forces, um, when in fact, at the end of the day, the biggest challenges we face are largely political, are getting governments that have the competence that are able to use effectively these new actors in the foreign policy space, that are able to produce transparent, responsive, uncorrupt government for their people that in the end of the day begins to translate in prosperity and development and jobs for all the young people in the world. That in the end of the day, that hard problem we still have not solved. And I'll give you Pakistan. We can use drones in Pakistan till the day, you know, till the cows come home. And we will not solve that problem until we get a Pakistani government that is non-corrupt, that is competent, that is, uh, that is responsive to its people and able to show them a, a better way of life, and then can take responsibility for security within its own, uh, within its own borders. So you know, it's great to talk about, about you know, the new military instrument. It's great to tech, talk about technology. But I think General Dempsey alluded to this. In the end of the day, it, these problems are going to need to be solved politically by a new kind of governance, and then by governments that are able to mobilize and use these other non-state actors, the, 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 the affirmative non-state actors, to try to mobilize their societies to try to solve some of these problems. Thank you, Steve. Jim, what's, what's your take on what's going on in the world, and how do we, how do we get a handle on it? Barry, let, me, let me, if I could, start by also thanking the Atlantic Council and thanking you for hosting this panel. It's a tough set of issues, and I won't pretend to have all the, all the answers. What I'd like to do is just say a couple words about the, 
positive side of technology. I could go on, any of us could go on at length about that, but it's important to have that as a baseline. And then build directly on what Steve had to say by talking about some key differences that we, that we have today relative to what we've been used to. Pace is one of them, as, as, as Steve highlighted. On the positive side, you've got hundreds of millions of people globally being connected with wireless technology, uh, uh, bringing them outside of their communities for the first time ever. That's per year. You have biotechnology uh, uh, advancing the health, not just the United States, but globally as well, and that affects uh, hundreds of, of millions. And ultimately, the technology-driven economic growth that we're seeing globally is lifting the, is lifting the votes for billions of people. And uh, for example, over the last 25 years, life, to, life expectancy globally has increased by six years to 70 years. Very different in the developing world at 60 years versus the developed world at 80 years. So more opportunity even based on today's technology, which keeps advancing. So the, that side of the coin is extremely positive. Uh, as you think about the other side, and as you think about the technology that we face today and the risk that it poses, I think it's useful to think about five uh, attributes that we're seeing today that are quite different from what we've seen in the past. And especially as you think about the key technology innovation of the of the previous century of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, very different from that. Uh, the first is breadth. We have technology changing today across such a wide range of issues. Much of it is driven by information technology, but biotech, uh, all, all elements of cyber, 3D, 4D printing, I could go on. All of them occurring at the same time and they, and they interrelate as well. Uh, the second, Steve mentioned, that's the pace of technology. Uh, uh, Moore's law is being exceeded in many of the other areas uh, today. Uh, in other words, the doubling of what can be put on a semiconductor every 1.5 years. Biotech and many other areas are moving faster than that. Uh, and there's no uh, doubt about that. There's some good analysis, actually, that demonstrates that in many of these areas. Third is diffusion. Uh, much of today's emerging technology is a accessible not just to a, a major state, but to small states, to, to not, and not just to large groups, but small groups and potentially individuals. So the diffusion of these new technologies, including uh, autonomous systems, including uh, destructive capabilities as well, uh, uh, is, a, is a big difference. Fourth and related, it's much easier to conceal capabilities today than it was relative to either nuclear or conventional forces. I could have a bio lab in my basement. I don't. Uh, I have a teenage son that approximates it, perhaps. But, uh, and I have, uh, and I could have, or any one of us could have, uh, a very powerful cyber weapon on our home computer. I, I, I don't, or at least I didn't put it there. Uh, and so that's a different. The the potential for for concealment is 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 very different. And then, and then finally. Uh, we have new vulnerabilities as well to a, to a range of factors. I'll just mention three very quickly. First is globalization, the dependence of the global economy on IT for finance and logistical movement of, of, of goods. Our critical infrastructure's uh, dependence on information technology. And then more broadly, globalization means that, as we've seen with MERS uh, uh, today, uh, that an infection in one part of the world or an action in one part of the world can have global effect uh, very rapidly. So technology is bringing, obviously, huge new opportunities. Um, these elements that I described as, as key differences, I think, are what our strategy for dealing with these, this new uh, period uh, need to address. OK, thanks, Jim. I have uh, both excellent um, cogent thoughts on the first question. I might ask you a second question and then come back to a couple of your points in, the, in, 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 re, in regard to uh, your answers to my to my first question. So the, I think the next sort of big analytic framework we should work through here is how can the US government and, and other national leaders, including private sector leaders, in light of what you've both uh, characterized, how should they think, even think about strategy in light of this new context? Um, what might the US strategic approach be working with traditional allies and partners, working with non-traditional allies and partners, including in the private sector. And how can we sort of harness this network that we would use to try to leverage and sustain some of our advantages in a world that's changing so rapidly that I think 
we're losing some of the, some of the advantages that we've grown comfortable with because of these changes that, are, that, are, that will lead to surprises, as we've seen in Ukraine, but also other surprises to come. Uh, sort of, how can the US even think about strategy in this, in this, in this new era? Um, it's very tough. In, uh, since I've been out of government, I've been uh, doing a lot of work for companies, and I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, which is just uh, is a place that has decided that you can ride the tiger of change. I mean, they thrive on change and the uh, destructive creation that uh, comes out of there. And um, very entrepreneurial, people who make big bets, they take responsibility, they're held accountable by the markets, people succeed, people fail. Um, that's probably the model for riding the tiger of change. And then you come back to Washington and you know, a very risk averse culture um, with uh, very structured processes. In some sense, the Defense Department is the same way, you know, with a procurement processes that is a decade in bringing a weapon system to market. Personnel systems that assume people will come and spend 25 years in the military. Um, a situation where in order to avoid making mistake, we sort of spread uh, accountability among committees where everybody, you know, lots of names uh, have to be, uh, lots of checks have to be made in, in order for something to go forward. And in the end of the day, no single person is really accountable and held responsible. It is a, a culture that I think is the antithesis of, of what we probably need to deal with a situation of accelerating change. And the question is, is there a way to begin to adapt that culture, or at least in some sense to have a parallel culture. And, the, and Jim can talk more about this. We found in terms of Afghanistan and Iraq, what we needed is to supplement our traditional procurement process, which needs to be reformed, but basically have a nonprofit process where people could be given money, held accountable, and to develop very quickly technologies and, and, and items of hardware that are required by the warfare to deal yeah. with immediate and emerging threats. We're gonna have to find a way to modify our processes uh, in order to be able to make Washington look more like Silicon Valley. And you see it in Washington, you know, big established institutions are sometimes spinning off companies that are actually uh, organized much more on a Silicon Valley type model. We may need to do more of that. We can talk about what it means for strategy in a minute, but Jim has is, mm -hmm. is, is, uh, been a lot closer to some of these things than I have. Steve, that's great. Um, as you think about developing strategy, I again build very directly off what Steve has said. It, it's important to think about what are our advantages as a nation. Let me just list a, a handful of them. Steve hit the, the, the first and perhaps the most important, and that's our capacity for entrepreneurship and for risk taking. Uh, it can be profit driven, but it can also be security driven. If you look at the people that we have, uh, for all the discussion of where we are with our education system, there's no doubt we have the best graduate schools in the country and, that, and that's a critical uh, element of uh, future success. Unlike many of our competitors, uh, of our state, potential state competitors, we have scores of allies and partners globally. And not just sustaining those alliances and <coughs> but strengthening them and building them and, and making them more dynamic is going to be critical. And to me, the least important is scale. And sometimes scale gets in the way and you've got to work beside it. But the fact that we have uh, still by far the largest defense budget and largest uh, economy is an element of advantage as well. It's not the most important, it's the least important. I would suggest five priority areas. And uh, again, building very directly on what Steve had to say. The first is that we need to really invest in innovation. And I'm, I'm pleased that the Department of Defense protected science and technology in its, in its FY15 uh, budgetary submission. I think that that approach needs to be across departments. And I'll say more about, about uh, how that applies in private sector in, in a moment. Uh, but the process point that Steve Ray raised is, is spot on. Um, that parallel process that you described that helped get MRATs MRAPs to theater, help counter ID and so forth, didn't happen by itself. And if you read Secretary Gates' book, you, you, you recognize that he and, and some other seniors were beating hard on the system. 
uh, to create a new parallel process, and it's going to take some it's going to take some lifting and some and some risk taking. Part two of strategy is to, is indeed to partner more both uh, with private sector and internationally. And um, on the international side, uh, we need to do more co-production, more co-R&D, more technology sharing. Uh, and we need international cooperation to deal with the full range of, of the threats that we face. Uh, and we need to lean in on the private public side as well. We've begun to do that in cyber. We've begun to do that in some areas. The dial needs to be turned up further. Um, you get the better technology, you get a faster turn, and you get insight into emerging capabilities that you wouldn't otherwise have. As you think about that technology sector, um, one thing that we need to do, and it's my third point, is that we need to continue to uh, uh, continue to work on our export control reform and our and our technology security. I think this administration took some very good steps on both of those, uh, and the the framework needs to be to protect the crown jewels, but those should be truly uh, very limited set. Uh, and while the while the uh, uh, the reforms that have been done so far are valuable. It, it's, it's a first step in, a, in what needs to be much more significant. And we will uh, succeed not by protecting, but by accelerating innovation and by partnering. Uh, fourth is to establish norms, codes of conduct. And you see those efforts underway both government to government and, and track to as well, cyber, space, autonomous systems, and so on. Those are incredibly important and they in addition, to, uh, in addition to reducing the risk of inadvertent conflict, which is a key goal that we always talk about, it also increases the odds that the scientific community will be able to spot aberrant behavior. If you think about biotechnology, if someone is, gonna, is going to emerge with uh, new capabilities, it's much more likely uh, that that person will, emerge, will come out of a scientific community uh, that would have some insight into, into what, that, uh, what that person or group was doing before government was. Was. And fifth, uh, and this is, this is uh, challenging, uh, challenging to do as well, fifth is that we need to continue to, in, to increase our resilience. And by that, I include on our space ar architecture disaggregation, for example, on cyber hardening the architecture, uh, layered active defense, and from a, both a DOD and a U.S. government perspective, we need to be prepared to operate in a degraded environment. Uh, and yes, uh, it's true in bio as well. Uh, we need to reduce the consequences of being hit, but that, that defensive posture is not solely for the purpose of defense because it also allows us to be able to more effectively respond. Mm -hmm. And so the, the deterrence by both uh, denial and by uh, uh, where, wherever possible and by the threat of response as well. Uh, uh, are both enhanced by increasing resilience. And it's it, in each of the areas that we, that we need to be concerned about, there's some heavy lifting to be done. Uh, and it's going to require a faster cycle. Great. Um, boy, you raised so many interesting and, and important questions. I mean, I think the one that's the hardest of all of the issues that has, been, has already been discussed here is the, is the Washington institutional right. culture, <laughs> both uh, in the executive branch and in the legislative branch, uh, former Secretary Gates said on Face the Nation uh, Sunday when asked, what do you think is the greatest national security threat to the United States? And he said, it's the, it's the, the two, square, two square mile area between Capitol Hill and the White House. Um, uh, but I, I think it does, I mean, I, I worry so much that, that our institutions are so slow to change, both institutions that they won't keep up. I mean, the, the presumption in government is that governments will lead. But I worry that I think your excellent suggestions that the private sector needs to drive some of these things. We're moving in that way in cyber, but even just in the last um, uh, 10 minutes here, we've talked about bio, where talk about owning the domain. I think, I think it's private sector actors that will drive what's going on in bio. Um, we've had headlines of energy security because of the Ukraine crisis, and it's energy companies that will drive um, uh, appropriate strategies there. So, are there any? Is there? What's your best? Are there? Is there any way for us to deal with this culture in in a way that is um, proactive uh, instead of waiting for the next disaster and we try to recover after that? Yeah, I'll take a shot at that. It's uh, it's very hard, um, and. 
Madeleine Albright has a wonderful construct she uses about sort of five elements, the factors that go into a country's foreign policy. And the first two are objective factors and subjective factors. And Jim is absolutely right. If you look at the objective factors, there is no country better positioned than to ride, to ride this tiger than the United States. Objectively, that is true. But the question then becomes the subjective factor. Do we have the will and the courage and vision to harness all of these positive elements in a strategy that is effective at um, figuring out this new world and a strategy for the United States to live in it in a way that will advance the well-being of our people? That's the $64 question. And that's a question of institutions. And uh, the track record is not particularly good. And, and you see the challenge. And I'd like to, to pick up where Moises Naim left off. He said, you know, everybody says the government has to do better at strategy and longer term planning. And yet, we all know that once you get in, uh, particularly the White House, you're just dealing with crises. And the one thing you know is that if all you do is deal with crises and don't put in place strategies and policies that will head off crises, all you're going to get is more crises. And you're going to be dealing with crises all the time. It's a vicious cycle. Now, we can talk a bit about the kinds of things you can try to do in government to do a better job of developing strategy and putting in place policies. But you can see the problem You know, if you're Susan Rice. You've got to deal with all of these crises because the president is asking you. They're in the headlines. You're getting killed, you know, by the by the uh, by the cognoscenti in Washington for you know being behind the crises. You've also got to be able to figure out and look forward and put in policies in place that are going to head off crises. And then the other thing you have to realize is nothing is ever done because so many of these problems at base are political and require societal changes. You know, they take a long time. I mean, we thought in 89 and 90 that Europe was done, whole, free, and at peace, respecting sovereignty, respecting territorial integrity. People can choose their own alliances, and no use of force or threat of use of force. Well, it turns out Vladimir Putin didn't accept that. And we now see that Europe is not done. And in fact, that vision of Europe is really under siege. So one of the problems for, for Susan is none of these crises go away. So the challenge of organizing the government to be able to do that is immense. I will just say one thing and stop. There is a terrific opportunity, though, for this wonderful think tank, do tank community you have in Washington to do some of that lifting and uh, to be able to take the time and do some things outside of the government that government does not have the time to do. And my experience is if you do that and have a good product, you will have a very willing customer in terms of the government to hear it. And what does that mean? It means, one, we need to have some radical collaboration among think tanks. You know, now my sense is, and you know, I'll probably get shot by Fred for this, but, uh, or by my board at USIP. But, you know, my sense is we're pretty stovepiped. Everybody want, is got roughly the same organizations dealing roughly over the same issues, wants their own programs, and wants their own funding sources. And so we have an enormous amount of duplication, rather than what we really need is some radical collaboration among this think tank community. Second of all, I think we do too much policy and not enough strategy not enough think, stepping back and saying, what's the world going to look like? What are our objectives in that world? And what are the kinds of strategies that are going to get us to achieve those objectives? Uh, that kind of thinking, I think, we do not do enough of. And I think it is something that outside the government, in some sense, you have the kind of time that many times you don't within the government. So, we can talk about what you need to do within the government. It's hard. I tried to do some as national security advisor. I give myself a C plus on uh, what we're able to accomplish. Uh, but I think it's also a terrific opportunity. Last thing for outside of government, last thing, one of the other things government needs to learn how to do because of all these new actors in the foreign policy space, 
how you can organize th those actors in such a way so that they can be part of pursuing strategies that achieve objectives for our country. How do you involve the NGO communities? How do you involve business? How do you involve foundations? How can you use their activities in a way that leverages um, US government's own activities as part of a, a, a common strategy? We're just barely beginning to think about how to do that. <clears throat> Very good. Jim, Jim, what do you think? I mean, I, what I heard just from Steve was the government relies on on private sector actors, and in some cases contractors, but in this case the think tank community. We're, we're sort of thinking of outsourcing strategy to a degree to a pri it's a public private partnership on strategy. Well, I wouldn't say outsourcing, Outsource but, is the wrong word, but, but, but <laughs> doing some of the thinking outside uh, and then bringing the product so that it can accelerate the process in the government. That's what I would, how I would try to describe it. Barry, I fundamentally uh, agree with Steve. Before I dive into, the, into that, let me say that I also unfortunately uh, fully agree with your with your diagnosis and the, the poster child for the Department of Defense is sequestration uh, and it's you know continuing looming shadow but that has implications uh, not just for the defense planning and, and uh, what happens in the next few years for defense it has implications for how our international partners allies and potential adversaries view us and view our ability to act coherently as a nation we are punching below our our weight, not just because of sequestration, but because of, uh, of the challenges and the relationship between the uh, between Congress and the administration, and and because of of in many areas a fundamental breakdown of bipartisanship. And I think that the the work that Steve outlined, in, in addition to bringing new ideas together, uh, if you bring in a good mix of, of think tanks on a project like uh, this or a set of projects, uh, you're also going to bring in, to some degree, pro proxies for alternative views that would reflect back on, on Capitol Hill and the administration and so on. Um, I don't think you can outsource strategy uh, from government, uh, but uh, centralized innovation is an oxymoron. And the idea you know, that, that particularly the people with little time uh, responding to crisis and so on will have the best ideas for thinking long term uh, is unlikely. So uh, the, a good strategist in government should think of herself or himself as a node in a network and trying to tap the, mm -hmm. the other exactly nodes. Exactly right. Um, exactly right. The other, the other piece uh, that I was saying, is it relates to the, you know, centralized innovation not being uh, feasible, uh, is that bottom up is, uh, is, is likely to be more effective if you think broadly. And I mean by that private sector, nonprofits. Uh, and, uh, and there's got to be some accountability. Uh, to our government performance. It's difficult when you see f fingers being pointed across the river uh, 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 in some sense, but really uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue for the most part between the White House and Congress or between the, the parties. It's very difficult, but uh, at, a, at a fundamental level, uh, what both private sector, nonprofits, and those who are motivated in government can do is uh, show what it means to be strategic. Show what it looks, what it can look like, both in terms of, 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 a, of, a, of an approach and processes, and then uh, work to hold people accountable for meeting that. It's a long-term challenge. We're in a we're in a we're in a bad spot, uh, but uh, as I said at the outset, I think we have some tremendous advantages as a country that we yeah. can that we can exploit uh, to move forward. Jim just said something I think very important, which is which we don't think about in government, um, and that is the bottom up. Because of the way our population is changing over the, 20 year, the next 20 years, because of the communication technology and all the rest, um, people are empowered and able and enabled and can be part of the solution for some of these problems. When you particularly think about you know, um, conflicts and resolving conflict, um, there, there is a, an opportunity for NGOs and civic organizations and foundations and even corporations to be working at the grassroots level to build support for innovations that can resolve conflicts and bring peace. So, for example, why is it that yet another effort at Israeli-Palestinian peace has failed? I think it's because we view it as top down. You bring the actors into the room and try to you know, put maps on the table and do the deal. What we have not spent enough time is engaging 
religious groups, settler communities, uh, the civil society that are in Israel and Palestine and seeing if you can organize them so that they can become active at, you know, advocates from the bottom up for a peace arrangement. Um, there is a, at USIP, there are a group of uh, folks who work Iraq and they're, um, one of the things that they have done and I hope the US government is gonna ask them to do is we need reconciliation between Shia and Sunni in Iraq. That link has been broken. This election could come, could be an opportunity to rekindle that. But what is missing is there is not support within the Sunni community for that kind of reconciliation so that Sunni leaders know that if they step forward and walk into a meeting with Shia to try to find some kind of path forward for reconciliation, they won't be attacked at home. Um, we, have, we have just, I think, not considered the changing environment, the changing population, the empowering of communications to allow us to engage societies in these communities to solve some of these problems of war and peace we have. That's a, a huge frontier. You know, every time we have a top-down solution to a problem, we ought to, ought to be asking ourselves, so what's the bottom-up complement that can facilitate a solution to a problem? Speaking of bottom-up, and grassroots, we have our first question from Twitter from on, on this discussion from, from um, Katie Putz, who said, if we want to make DC more like Silicon Valley, how do we bring younger, innovative, and more diverse voices into the conversation? I th uh, Another difficult question. Wanna, I, I think one of the things we have to do is we have to look very hard uh, from the government level about our personnel systems in the State Department and in DOD. And um, we have to, you know, ask the question, what is it that we need? And one of the things we need, of course, is some of these younger people um, who have, who are going to be the future um, and who will see it better than we do uh, as the older generation and can start infecting in a positive way our institutions. We don't do that very well. You know, we have a lot of restrictions in terms of where we look for people and who we bring in, you know, security clearances and all the rest. But we have a situation where we sort of assume people come in for life. And we don't have a flexible situation that says, these are the kinds of people we need. This is where we find them. Let's, let's recruit them, bring them in, recognize that they're not going to be here for 30 years. We don't want them to be here for 30 years. This younger generation doesn't want to be any place for 30 years. They want to move from, from job to job and, and place to place. Um, it's a different culture, and we need to adapt to that culture, and we need to find a way where we can be entrepreneurial, identifying you we need, bring them in, free them to work on a project pro program and, our, and a particular project, then recognize that they're going to leave us and that that's okay. And we've got to have a personnel system, a compensation system, a evaluation system that accommodates that. We don't have that now. And as a consequence, you know, too many people look like me. And not enough people look like the way America looks today. <clears throat> uh, Barry, I, I agree with the basic premise Steve has put forward. Uh, but many of the tools to, to accelerate the movement of, of young people and talented people into government exist, including the Presidential Management Fellow Program, which is a small number, uh, Intergovernmental Personal, Personnel Act Fellows, uh, term appointments, and of course, political appointments as well. And you can, you can get a reasonable amount of, of velocity as long as you're moving people out of the organization to build out that network as well. And the, the real challenge is that in an era of declining resources and where, for example, DOD is, is taking significant reductions in the, over, in, the, in, the, in the dollars associated with its personnel, including civilian personnel and military, but also contractor support, IPAs, that those those degrees of freedom to bring in, uh, whether contractors, IPAs, and so on, uh, that the liquidity that came out of the out of the checkbook is not there anymore, mm -hmm. and so it's going to make this it's going to make the, the underlying challenge much more difficult actually than it was uh, prior to the to the budget mm -hmm. uh, pressures that we're now under. So it, it, it's going to require it's going to require ch systemic changes to offset that. I, I think that 
Jim is absolutely right. I think one of the things we can do again that the think tank community can do, and I expect people have already done it, uh, are doing it, but um, they can be a vanguard of trying to reach out and bring in and involve in the works of think, think tanks these younger people so they, they get the training and knowledge um, that they need so when the opportunities do open up for them to serve in government, they're ready and prepared. Um, but it's a huge problem. We've, uh, we need a real generational transition, and for the reasons Jim has described, it's very hard in a time of austerity for, you, for the government to be able to do that. I think that's right. I mean, it seems like as we all acknowledge the need for these more flexible approaches, the culture, the political, almost the governance capacity of the United States itself is, not, is heading in the wrong direction with reduced funding for these kinds of measures and a culture that now is even uh, challenging regarding having conferences because of the, the GSA um, uh, issues that hit the headlines a few, a few years ago. So just when we need more integration, more flexibility, more ability to bring in new voices, we're, we're in, a difficult, in a difficult spot. But I think you're right, those without such restrictions should be trying to lead the way uh, into, this, into this new world. I think now is a good time to to look for questions from the, the physical audience as well here. And we have Frank Hoffman in the, as the first questioner. Hi, Frank Hoffman from the National Defense University. I have a question that gets at the core of the, the mission of the Atlantic Council and that deals with alliances and coalition partners of the past and the future. Uh, Steve was quite a bit optimistic about demographic trends, but if you look at Japan and Europe, uh, our partners are older, smaller, poor, and uh, from a productivity viewpoint, you know, perhaps somewhat diminished. So uh, do we need to offboard uh, old partners and get them off the tiger? Do we need to uh, revitalize our alliances and, and partnerships? Or do we need to seek new partners in both in Europe and in Asia? Uh, you, it's a good Three. amendment. On the Global Trends 2030, what, you, what I should have said on that litany of they're younger, they're urban, they're middle class, they're connected, and they're overwhelmingly living in developing rather than developed societies. And as Jim was saying, so we've got to have new partners. And that's one of the things that's going to change. You know, um, we, are, we are going to need to build strategic partnerships and relationships with countries like Brazil and with India and with Indonesia and uh, with countries that have not been our traditional allies because they are going to have a, a huge say in how this uh, world moves in the next 20, 30 years. I would just briefly uh, uh, say, Frank, I'm in full agreement with Steve on this. Yeah, I know that your first suggestion was a straw man, uh, and, uh, but your second two of revitalizing our existing alliances and partnerships and seeking new ones. Uh, both are on the mark, uh, and uh, that's not just formal uh, government to government. If you think about the rest of our conversation, it also includes taking steps uh, to try to build people to people, institution to institution uh, bridges as well, uh, uh, including including not just think tanks but other other nonprofits. <coughs> and, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, building more areas for cooperation on technology as well overseas. There's a lot of a lot of very talented people in other countries that we can, uh, we can be advantaged by if we're able to, to bring that in. Let me just sort of follow up on this very important point, I think, that, that was just raised, this people-to-people -people issue. And, and I think it's the first time we've sort of used that phrase in this discussion. And I have to say, I worry that it's another aspect of our current government uh, strategies and processes that we, if, if, that's e if that even comes up, it, it's an afterthought. But there's a real opportunity for technology. And it's, it's, it's part of this notion about in involving societies in these questions of war and peace and, and all the rest that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody says exchange programs are wonderful things when young college students for the United States go and they study in China and Europe or wherever and when foreign students can come here. But they're very small. And, and I think we all agree, they're great. They're very small. Only one and a half percent of American college students will spend some time abroad during their college years. But with technology, uh, there is this notion of, you know, uh, virtual exchanges 
that you can have a structured way to bring students who are in other uh, countries and the United States in dialogue in a structured way. Um, and you uh, save a lot of airfare. Uh, and you can ha begin to have exchanges with folks that are in dangerous areas that you might not want uh, your son or daughter uh, to go to. This is something that is now being done. It, uh, the initial data shows that it does build some understanding um, and does help uh, to reduce stereotypes and other things. Uh, Secretary Kerry has seized it and is trying to make it part of a federal program of virtual exchanges. So this is a case where you know, technology can overcome barriers of time and space and really be a vehicle for engaging people to people and engaging society so you can begin to have this kind of bottom-up pressure in addition to what governments do on a top-down basis. I agree completely. And one of the things that government can do is help knock down barriers in addition to piling on on technology whether it's export control or technology security that allows a certain type of cooperation or, the, uh, uh, or allowing uh, our folks to get uh, more readily uh, uh, to be able to move from, country, from the United States to other countries and back uh, and to engage in not just educational programs but in, in, in work as well, uh, I think is, is going to be part of the, has got to be part of the solution. Great. Let me go to another question. Before I do, I mean, the thought comes to me, I can't think of the highest official in, in any department whose only job it is to deal with, with people, you know, with, with what some call that this is the new age of people power, I've, I've heard said. Mm -hmm. And I worry that we're not even sort of structurally paying attention to it. There's desk officers for countries, for regions, for major functions like cyber, and, I, and it, it, this probably should be infused throughout all of those programs. But I worry that there's no one yep. there to catalyze it. I think, Jim, way back in your mm -hmm. career, you, were, uh, you had responsibility for counterproliferation policy when it was a new initiative. Mm -hmm. and I think the thought was, get that into the system, mm -hmm. and then that position goes away, and it, and it becomes more mm -hmm. institutionalized and, and proliferates throughout the apparatus. I wonder if we need something similar sort of in this space. Probably do. And it ought to be somebody who's certainly under 40 and probably under 30. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, gentleman in the middle there. Thank you very much for all your insights. Uh, I'm Sergio de la Peña. I'm an independent consultant. Could you address the factors of economics into strategic planning relative to defense? There's a saying in vernacular Mexican Spanish that goes something like this. It says, con dinero hay el perro, which means with money the dog dances. We're now, to the tune, we're now in debt to the tune of $17 trillion and no foreseeable solutions to that debt. And if you look back at the previous century, where you had the Weimar Republic coming apart because of economics and thus in some factor precipitating World War II. Uh, do you see something like that in this century? I guess let me first address uh, what I think was the initial part of your, of your question, and that is defense spending as a percentage of GDP is, is declining. It's declining substantially. And we're on a we're on a path that's not very different from the from the declines that we've seen after after major conflicts and after the end of the Cold War. We're headed back to, toward three percent of GDP. So, just to be clear, uh, if you're anyway suggesting that defense spending is a driver uh, of our economic situation, I don't think that I don't think that that is the that is the case. Um, if it is uh, that we ought to, that we need to get our economic house in order and and deal with the with the running deficits that we've got. Uh, and as you look over, over time, those deficits are projected to grow substantially. Uh, under, and then understand that economic power is the basis in pretty fundamental ways for political and military power over time. I think that that's right. And, it, and it, what, it, what it means is that the very same uh, political process that we talked about before that's been, that's been stuck uh, uh, for some time on these issues, and that resulted in sequestration, uh, you know, what Secretary Panetta called a crazy meat axe approach from the Department of Defense perspective, 
we need we need to step up. Uh, we, uh, we need our leadership to step up to those uh, those programs, and it and it means addressing entitlements, especially, and that is ex obviously extraordinarily challenging. Over time, uh, if we don't do it, we will see ourselves decline as a uh, uh, decline uh, in a way that is uh, unnecessary and is shooting ourselves in the foot, if not somewhat higher. Thanks. Another question? Um, in the way back, at, against the back wall, behind you? Behind you? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I very much enjoyed this talk. Um, uh, I would like to know, um, Dr. Miller, you, you said some very interesting things. Could you please thing. identify yourself? Sorry. Oh, David you... Bren. I'm, I'm the, on the last panel this evening where you get some <laughs> of the far out ideas that you were talking about and asking for, uh, or at least you know, beyond the five-year horizon. Um, yes, I was very interested in, first, you're talking about uh, in, in export reform and investing in innovation, but we are between a rock and a hard place there as far as IP theft is concerned, and it's becoming a critical matter where the inventing nations are, well, let's, let's in the perspective is 100 years ago, we were IP theft thieves, so, you know, we don't get mad, we just try to solve the problem. I'd like your response on that, but you also spoke on resilience in a degraded en environment, and I think that's incredibly important. But I was wondering why nobody ever uh, discusses in that context of resilience the one thing that worked on 9-11, and that was citizen power. It was empowered citizens that did everything that worked that day, the day that the professional caste failed. Uh, uh, let me take the... Uh, questions in, in reverse order. Uh, resilience for public health comes uh, significantly from population. If you think about, if you think about a contagious virus that was circulating, then the steps that individuals take to wash hands and and avoid uh, contamination are important. But fundamentally, from our from our public health system, so the uh, and our public safety system as well. So I, I certainly agree that that's a critical part of resilience. But there are a lot of other dimensions as well, uh, whether it's the, it's the IT that undergirds uh, our, some of our critical infrastructure, including financial institutions uh, or, or other areas. There are, there are multiple elements of it. You've named uh, one important one. On the, on the question of IP theft, um, we have raised the issue with, uh, with one country that's been engaging in significant IP theft, the uh, PRC and have continued to press them, our government has continued to press them on that issue. We need to do better at defending our information. And um, uh, we, we will be, we will have two advantages if we, if we, if we defend our information, and our critical information especially. Um, the, the vast majority of, of material that travels over the internet is not in this category. Um, uh, but that that's critical, we need to protect and we need to hold people accountable for its protection. Uh, that has its own inherent value, uh, obviously, of reducing the, the leakage. It also pro provides a more credible basis for taking actions to respond to, to uh, extensive IP theft, whether it's, whether it's individual sanctions, whether it's on the trade front or otherwise. And by way of analogy, if, if you were leaving bags of money sitting out on your front porch, and every day you came out and the bags of money were gone, yeah, someone stole them. Uh, but you weren't doing a very good job of protecting them. You need to protect, and we need to protect that critical information more effectively, and we need to continue to press China and others uh, to, to abide by uh, appropriate rules of the road for, for behavior uh, in cyberspace and with respect to intellectual property. I'll, um, I do not consider myself a futurist, and my comments today probably have, dead of, have, uh, have <laughs> demonstrated that I'm not. But I think the, the thing you suggested in your question, I think, is right. These new technologies in the hands of authoritarian, authoritarian regimes can be vehicles for repression, but they are also can be dramatically democratizing and empowering inst uh, instruments. 
And I think that is a good thing because I think on a lot of the problems you've described, we are not going to solve them at the governmental level. They're going to be solved at the societal level. If we can get citizenry engaged in trying to get some purchase on these problems. And it requires a, a sensible discussion about what is the role of the government, what is the role of private organizations, and what is the role of the citizen. And how can they be mobilized in a sensible way to solve some of these problems that re really will only be s solved if you can mobilize the society as a whole? We're not having that kind of conversation. And I think we need to have it. I think it's a huge opportunity. And I think people will be delighted to live in countries where they are looked to and empowered to help build a better society. My reading of kids, which comes largely from my own two children who are in their 20s now, is there's huge distrust of, of big institutions. Um, they, they don't look for hierarchical authority that is more lateral authority. They look to each other. And they want to participate in building a better society, but they're very distrustful of all these big institutions. We've got to somehow find a way to harness that and focus it on these kinds of problems and move the society forward. I think it's terrifically exciting. I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, we have a couple questions in the front here. Um, Frank Kramer and then Paul Gephardt, I think, had their hands up first. Uh, I'm Frank Kramer, Atlantic Council. So uh, I want to follow up on what you just said in an earlier point, and that is uh, you referenced Silicon Valley as a great place. Um, I agree with that. And, but then the both of you seem to say that the government uh, needs to take the lead still in the strategy, uh, bring it inside. And I want to suggest that maybe it's the other way around, which is what your latest comment said. And the question I have is a place like Silicon Valley is still very much appropriately capitalist oriented. Let's say they're trying to make money for themselves. Do we need to think about a structure that drives more, I'm use the word public good, uh, into the entrepreneurial structure? Question one. And then question two, uh, you already said you don't know how to do it, but let's try again. Uh, how do we actually get the citizens uh, involved you know, for the public good? Uh, you know, we've got Twitter going, uh, which is a great, uh, it seems to me it's a technique uh, at the moment, not a solution, but it's a technique that maybe can become a solution. So one, what about businesses having more of a public good element? And two, what is the structure that we use uh, for the citizenry? I think the role of government is to art, uh, articulate the objectives for societies. I mean, that's what our political process is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a dialogue among the citizens about what it is we want to do. And that then needs to be, I think, articulated by our national leaders. And at a first order, there needs to be kind of some sense of what is our strategy for getting there. Uh, but that strategy, to develop the strategy, you need to engage all these societal stakeholders. And of course, you need then an implementation plan that engages them in the implementation of it. Uh, that's, again, this is this discussion about what should government do and what should uh, other uh, parties do. And then in the end of the day, you've got to mobilize people. You've got you to have national leaders who are willing to go out lead the debate and mobilize and motivate people. And of course, we've got all kinds of tools now for mass mobilization that we never had before. Instant communications. I mean, you can do it now. But, it's, but we've, we've really got to you know, have a focused, organized effort to do it. And I don't, I don't see it on almost any issue at this point. I would, I would build on that uh, response, Steve. Uh, uh, and just say that uh, government, uh, as you suggested, should set the objectives for the government. But you will also know that other actors will be doing that from their within their own domain, whether it's a nonprofit or a for profit. And that uh, working over over time, taking a long term view, uh, understand that you need to have rapid turn cycles to get make progress. Uh, but then working over time to empower to help empower those who are uh, aimed in a productive direction has got to be a fundamental element of uh, strategy from government's perspective. I, I think that may be what you're getting at, but, uh, but I certainly agree, agree with that point. 
and it's, a, it's just a different model than when you think, particularly as a lot of us grew up in a, through the Cold War where, you know, where security was provided by tanks, missiles, and so forth. Very different model. Um, Paul Gephardt and then Sherry Goodman. Hi, uh, Paul Gephardt with the Cone Group. I know both of you um, were uh, in, in the heat of crisis um, over several different iterations of your careers. And so my question is, do, over that time, uh, as you had to deal with various crises and decisions, how were you changing the way that you were going after those decisions? I mean, we've talked about the, the way in which the Cold War was different from, from the present. Well, Cold War was 25 years ago, so we have a lot of data post-Cold War. But how were you changing the way that you were driving decisions um, in more recent iterations of your careers in government as opposed to it earlier? I'll take a, I'll take a cut. Um, hmm. And I'm, I'm going to answer, a, I'm not going to dodge your, your question, Paul, but I'm going to answer one that cuts through it. And just an observation that uh, the hardest time to think long-term and strategically is when you're in the middle of a crisis. The most important time to think long-term and strategically is when you're in the middle of a crisis. And so I, I certainly have seen uh, moments, and I, I'm sure it's true, uh, uh, when Steve was National Security Advisor, as well as with this administration prior, where uh, time will be carved out uh, mm -hmm. to say, uh, let's look hard at what our objectives are here. Let's look at whether we need to lower the bar in terms of what we're trying to achieve, extend the time horizon, bring more resources to bear when things aren't going well, uh, um, uh, or what other steps need to be taken. And the, um, uh, the challenge from my perspective, and this is somewhat granular, it, that's got to be part of the schedule. I won't say 9 to 5, maybe you know, 8 to 9, 8 a.m. To, 8 to 9 p.m. for a White House uh, typical how day. About, how about 5 to 8? 5 to 8. <coughs> eight. Uh, but a.m. to p.m. <laughs> it's got to be built into that schedule. I, um, and again, get relatively fine-grained. I've certainly participated in a lot of useful weekend sessions where you carve out time. Yep. It's uh, uh, to do that, but uh, those are adjuncts, and you've got to build that strategic thinking into the, into the calendar. Um, I, I have certainly seen instances in my time in government where that's been done uh, and, done, and done effectively. Uh, but it's, it, with the multitude of issues that are coming at us, the, just the triage associated with dealing with those. And the final point, the, the, the sometimes, um, sometimes very toxic relationship uh, with Capitol Hill makes it more challenging if you, if you have to spend a lot of time on issues that otherwise would not be um, of central importance. Uh, uh, for example, I just say, say the word Benghazi. Uh, it was important in its time. It's important to take the right lessons from it. And then it's important to move on and operate as a, as a country. Uh, and the cost associated with having to do redo after redo on issues uh, for political purposes is really opportunity cost. Uh, and it comes in part, and no small part, out of strategic <coughs> thinking and out of the ability to gain consensus for that thinking. I think it's a very different. I, I came up in the political military line rather than the economic. And someone who did economic will have a different answer. But for me, when you and I were working together, these were state-to-state -state problems, mostly of war and peace. And basically, your instruments were the military and the diplomatic, and you were conducting your activities at the government-to-government -government level. Because the big tensions in the Cold War period were state to state. I think we're in a different world now. And so fast forward to dealing with the problems with Iraq, which or the problems of post 9-11 dealing with terrorism. Um, these are in some measure state to state, but mostly they're super state, you know, terrorism, you know, obliterating state borders, as you're seeing in Iraq and Syria. And then tensions within countries. Um, and so it's, and, and there you're dealing with a host of different actors. And you're, in order to solve the problem, you need to have a fusion of US military power selectively, our ability to train security forces of other countries. But again, none of that works if, unless it is in a context of governments that are becoming more accountable, more transparent, uh, less corrupt, um, more competent, 
and fused with development and economic strategies that actually can put young men and women in jobs that are productive, that have a future, rather than making them unemployed and being available for recruitment by terrorists. It's, it is a uh, less a state-to-state -state challenge. It requires uh, you to mobilize a whole different set of actors, and it requires you to use a whole different set of tools. I mean, we say, you, you know, it's not just a whole of government response we need today. It's a whole of society response. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to organize. And we, have, we have not really done that particularly well as a government. So the world now, I think, uh, blessedly in some sense, um, is very different. And it requires a different set of skills and strategies. And I think to the, the tools that are still taught in our schools that we use to deal with the world my sense is, you know, even just in light of this discussion, those are outdated. I think, I think uh, we still teach in our professional curricula diplomatic information, military, and economic. But there are so many more tools that you two have just discussed today. I think, I think how we think about those tools also needs a revolution. Perry, I, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, you see a lot of evidence today that hard power still matters. That and sure so does. it's not that it's not that the new the new technology and tools will displace mm -hmm. diplomacy mm -hmm. or military and so on. It's that we've got to be Supplement. able to we've got to be able to add them to the toolkit and use right. them effectively. Yeah, exactly right. Sherry Goodman, and then we're going to start doing a lightning round. Okay. Thank you, Sherry Goodman, CNA Corporation. Thank you, uh, Steve, Jim, and, and Barry, for an interesting and, and disruptive panel. So, uh, two uh, questions, uh, comments. Steve, you talked about. Um, collaboration among think tanks to get out of the stovepipes and address some of the hard problems. In defense, the hardest problem is that the defense budget is being eaten by uh, the so-called entitlement costs, the compensation and retirement right. and health care costs, as well as a failure to uh, approve another base closure round. Those are the big three. Uh, what about an effort among think tanks on the left and the right um, to address those hard problems. You and I tried to address them a few years ago on the QDR independent panel, right. and you know nothing much has happened, but we need to mobilize across both sides of the aisle to address the intractability uh, within Congress to take on what is, I think, considered to be a reasonable agenda by moderates in both parties. Um, <clears throat> and so there might be some, I'd be interested in your thoughts uh, on that. Secondly, on the public participation, gauge, public engagement, um, I agree on many of these issues we need to do more. Traditionally, as you observe, foreign policy, defense was sort of an elite world, but it's changed. But I, when Jim and I were in the Pentagon in the 90s, you know, in, in my portfolio and environment, environmental security, public participation and public engagement was a cornerstone of what we did to try to turn around the views of defense uh, and make it an environmental leader. I see that same happening in these some of these non-traditional areas, like in climate security. Now we've moved pretty much away from is it a problem as a society. Even our own John Huntsman, the chairman here, has written recently about um, Republicans need to be serious on climate change. So you see now, I think, from the outside looking into government that it is able to we are able to sort of mobilize on a question and move it, although it, it takes a long time. Um, and so bringing, bringing the innovation that's in Silicon Valley on some of these non-traditional areas and others might be a very good opportunity. And, and I'd like to get your thoughts, particularly having recently served on the inside, Jim. Thank you, Sharon. Let me respond uh, very briefly on that. The, um, the challenge of getting after infrastructure and and uh, personnel costs in the Department of Defense is, is fundamental. Uh, and the idea of bringing together uh, a range of, <coughs> of uh, think tanks to work on that is great. Uh, bring in members <coughs> and key staff from the Hill as well, because uh, presenting them a product that they, that they haven't had uh, engagement on, uh, it will not be as valuable as, ha as one that, where they have been engaged. And I think a little bit of immersion in the real, the real data of what the nature of the problem is and what it looks like um, in the out years, in the coming 5, 10, 15 years for the Department of Defense if we don't deal with this problem is important. Uh, and there is, as, as you imply, sort of an analog to Augustine's law 
of, of procurement where we projected forward, and as you, as you all know, and that if we didn't get acquisition costs under control, that by 2050 we'd be able to afford one tank, one ship, uh, and one airplane. And so that that is still an issue. We need to drive those down. But it's also true on on the personnel and on the uh, infrastructure side. And uh, we're nowhere near where we need to be uh, in terms of having a consensus to deal with those. Two quick vignettes. One, I think there is a huge scope for bringing Republicans and Democrats right and left together and try to get a consensus for how to solve a problem. We, Sherry and I served together on the national, uh, the independent panel to review the last QDR four years ago. Uh, Bill Perry and I co-chaired it. Diverse group, Republicans, Demo Democrats, we got a consensus report. And we did it by aiming high, not seeking for a lowest common denominator, but actually to be ambitious. I think there's a huge scope for that. And it gives the administration you, new ideas and political cover. Secondly, uh, in terms of outreach, we got to do it smart. Um, so it's uh, 2005, and al-Qaeda is killing us in the public affairs uh, realm. I mean, they are out you know, on the information operations. They're killing us every day. So I bring together in the Situation Room, the, in the uh, Roosevelt Room, you know, the public affairs folks from State Defense, all the rest. And they all look like me. They're mostly guys. They got gray hair. And, you know, they talk about, you know, press releases and, you know, you know, backgrounding press. And so we say, this isn't going to get us anywhere. So we send a disk of what Al-Qaeda is doing in terms of their information operations to CEOs of startup companies in Silicon Valley and saying, this is what is being done to us every day with this technology that we invented here in the United States, and they're killing us day in and day out. What would you do? Would you come to a meeting in the Roosevelt Room to talk about? And they came, and they're these young kids and they're very wealthy and they've got these great companies and they've got a gazillion ideas. Well, that's what we've got to capture. And then we've got to have a culture in the government that is receptive to them and is willing to implement them. That's the kind, we've got to do outreach in a very radically different way. And the tools are out there to do it and people who know how to use the tools are there, but they're in Silicon Valley, they're not in Washington. We've got to bridge that gap. I'm very upset personally that we are out of time. Uh, I would have loved to have gone on all day, although I don't know about your schedules. Just a few key words that I took from, from this conversation. Radically different, speed, private sector driven, riding the tiger of change, one of my favorite. Uh, bottom up, new voices, new processes. And then uh, even as I'm seeing the Twitter uh, accounts, I think there's a rich load of further work and thinking to do on strategy and on, on dealing with this new world. We have people microblogging this session right now, so please check on, our, on the atlanticouncil.org website uh, for further analyses. Uh, don't, ha don't miss the, drone and the drones and the 3D printer and the boardroom in that direction during the breaks. And, and please stay tuned and, and, and stay engaged with us as we continue to try to build a, a community to do strategy and thinking about this, this new world. And last but most importantly, please join me in thanking Steve Hadley and Jim Miller for this conversation. Thank you. Well done. Very good. Always, 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 always good. Always good.